Father, we are just grateful to be in your house tonight. Thankful that we can come here uh, to worship you, to praise you, to glorify your name. Thank you that we can have the word of God that's proclaimed with truth and grace tonight. Thank you that we have the ability to open the word of God and read it in our own tongue, in our own language. Thank you that we can be inspired by your Holy Spirit that is gifted to each of us when we ask Christ to be our Lord and Savior. Tonight, if someone doesn't know you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior, I pray that through the message and the music and the atmosphere that you will move in their life in such a way that they may bow their knee tonight to you and confess you as Lord and Savior. I pray for every believer in this room tonight, including myself, that we will be humbled before you, that we will come before you with a contrite spirit, that we will be sincere before you, asking you to examine our hearts and to remove every wicked way that is in us, to renew us, to give us a new heart and a new spirit, a new motive, a new focus, to draw us closer to you. We pray these things knowing that you promised these things by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, since you already took up the love offering before you heard me preach, uh, Pastor Chris, do you offer a money-back guarantee? <laughs> okay, good. Hey, thank you, brother. I appreciate Steve leading us to the throne, the music. I appreciate all of you being here tonight uh, and having an open heart to receive what God has for you. Um, we've been, I know you've been praying for this for a long time, and I have as well. I want to ask you a question this evening. What is your most valuable possession? What do you have that you consider to be the most valuable thing that you have? Let me ask you another question. If you would be able to find a treasure on the way home tonight, what would you want it to be? If you could find a treasure, it could be anything, what would you want it to be? You may recall it's been a year or two ago now that was all the, in the news about uh, a California couple, a husband, a wife, and a dog that were walking their property one day, and apparently they noticed something shiny sticking out of the ground. Apparently the, the wind and the rain had uncovered something that had previously been hidden under the ground. Well, the dog went over to investigate, and the, uh, the woman went over as well, and uh, they began to dig. The dog and the woman, they began to dig, and when they were finished digging, they had uncovered $10 million worth of precious gold coins. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, the news report never did say what kind of dog that was. <laughs> Somebody suggested it was a golden retriever. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I want one. I know. <laughs> I one of those dogs. You know, I think um, we're always fascinated with uh, treasure hunts and, and, you know, about finding hidden treasure. I think that's why a lot of people get uh, metal detectors and they scour the backyard and the beaches, you know, hoping to find something of value that's been hidden. There are some uh, individuals and corporations that spend millions of dollars hunting for sunken treasure in the, uh, in the oceans. There is something about uh, treasure that's hidden that we can find that uh, is fascinating to us. Charles IV of Spain uh, he was king of Spain in the early 1800s. And uh, he realized that Napoleon was about to invade his country. And he had in his possession uh, a very precious collection of antique clocks and, of course, the crown jewels of Spain. And he didn't want Napoleon to get those precious commodities, those, those items. So he decided that he would uh, hide them. And he had this idea that he would hide them inside the walls of the rooms of, of, the, uh, uh, of the mansion that he lived in. And so he had the clocks walled in in the one room in the mansion, and he had uh, the crown jewels hidden in the walls of another room. And he had a faithful servant take samples of the drapery from each of those rooms so he would know where they were hidden. Now, this is pretty important because there were 365 rooms in the mansion. 
And sure enough, the Napoleon invaded Spain. He took over the country, and he put his brother Joseph on the throne of Spain. Well, eventually, around 1814, Spain got control back from Napoleon, and they uh, regained their, their throne. And uh, Charles IV was no longer around, but his son, Ferdinand, was. And when Ferdinand became king of Spain, of course, he wanted to find those antique clocks. And he, he obviously wanted to have the crown jewels. Every king wants the crown jewels. So he uh, summoned that faithful servant who had the uh, samples of the drapery from the, those rooms where the items were hidden. The only problem was <laughs> all the draperies had been changed. <laughs> and so they were faced with the dilemma of whether to tear out all the walls in the mansion or just write it off as a loss. And so they wrote it off as a loss. And, you know, for, for years, for many, many years, they thought that was just a myth. Until probably about 50 years ago, some plumbers were working in the... Uh, in the mansion, and they uncovered that uh, collection of antique clocks. And so they know that somewhere now those uh, crown jewels are still there. There's something about stories of finding hidden treasure that fascinate us. And Jesus um, told a story, actually told two stories, they're found in Matthew chapter 13, about finding a hidden treasure. And obviously, uh, it was fascinating to them back then as well. And so in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46, Jesus tells two stories. They're, um, they're twin stories, but they're not identical twins, as you'll see in a moment. But they're about finding the greatest treasure that anyone could ever find. He tells these two stories about finding the one thing worth everything. And to him, what he's talking about here is finding the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about finding that one thing worth everything, which Jesus is saying is having a personal relationship with Almighty God. It's realizing that God loves you and that he wants you to be part of his family. And he wants to come into your life and change your life and, and, and give you the, the blessings that he wants for you, and to grant you eternal life. That is, uh, uh, that is, according to the story, what Jesus is talking about here, is finding the kingdom of heaven, which is the one thing worth everything. And as I said, there are two stories. One is about finding uh, a, a treasure that uh, unexpectedly. It's about surprised finders. And the other story is about serious seekers, about those who are seeking to find something valuable. But in both stories, the bottom line is they were willing to risk everything in order to possess the great treasure, the one thing worth everything. Now, it's a parable that Jesus was telling here, which, as you probably know, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so Jesus presents here a picture from the past, but in so doing tells us this timeless truth that he's sharing with us, how we can have the greatest of all treasures, that is, the person and power of God in our life. Let's look together in Matthew chapter 13. We're going to take these one at a time. Let's look at verse 44 first. He says this, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid, and from joy over it he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. Here's the first thing we need to understand about this parable. We think about the one thing worth everything. This story is about this. It's about the reality that God's treasure may be found unexpectedly. That's the timeless truth here. Is that God's treasure may be found unexpectedly. This is a story about somebody who suddenly finds what he's not even looking for. Isn't that what the story is? It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys the field. Here is a plowman, an everyday worker, just an ordinary guy, just a, a, a common laborer. The field isn't even his field. He works for somebody else. And I guess he got up this morning, just like he got up every morning. You know, he, 
he got up and he, you know, he got dressed and, and he had breakfast and he kissed the family goodbye and he went off to work and punched the clock and got all harnessed in behind the oxen and began to plow just like he had every day. Maybe he wasn't even thinking about what he was doing. He was just sort of mindlessly following that oxen and maybe he was thinking about uh, the bills that he had to pay or, or he's thinking about what dinner might be tonight or or problems with the kids. He was, his mind was probably somewhere else, and then suddenly the plow struck something. And I guess his probably first reaction was uh, aggravation. They didn't need this aggravation. And so he goes to inspect what the plow has struck, and he realizes that it's a treasure hidden in a field, and he uncovers it. And when he uncovers it, he puts it, he realizes what it is, and he puts it back in the ground. He hides it and then he goes and he sells everything that he has. Everything that he has. So that he could buy the field in order to possess this treasure that he had found unexpectedly. You think, boy, that's, that's pretty far-fetched. Imagine plowing a field and finding a hidden treasure. It's really not as unusual as you might think. And if you consider this for a minute, that uh, you know, in the uh, Middle East... For centuries, um, people didn't have safes to hide stuff. If they had something valuable, where, they, where were they going to hide it? Well, the likely place is in the ground. And it's a, pl- a part of the world where there was armies marching through all the time, different invasions, and, um, and you certainly want invading armies to have your stuff, your valuables, your treasures. So what do you do? You go out in the backyard or someplace and you hide it in the ground. And, and you hope that you remember where it was, <laughs> you know, when you come back. And oftentimes, he didn't come back. And so it stayed in the field. And people were really uncovering things that were hidden and buried all the time. And so they, they understood this, this story. But, of course, the point is that it was found unexpectedly. And it was such a valuable treasure that he was willing to sell everything that he had, give up everything else in order to possess this treasure. It became, for this plowman, the one thing worth everything. He was willing to give up everything else for it. He stumbled into joy. And that's often what happens, isn't it? We often stumble into joy. Realizing that God loves us and is willing to forgive us is is, comes burst on us like a sudden revelation, like uh, like a sunburst of unexpected light. Sometimes we're just not expecting it. And it just explodes upon our our, our being, and it, it's something we stumble over. The Apostle Paul talked about this in Romans chapter 10, verse 20. He, in fact, he quoted God from the Old Testament, and he said, he quoted God as saying, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. See, the truth of this first parable is that sometimes you can find the greatest treasure you can ever have unexpectedly. It can be a surprise. In fact, the Bible is full of occasions when people came unexpectedly upon the greatest thing they could ever experience in their life. Think about Moses, for instance. Here was Moses in exile from Egypt, spending 40 years on the backside of the desert, taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. And every day he would go out and deal with those sheep, and there seemed to be no hope of anything ever changing until one day God showed up in a burning bush, and Moses became a man on fire for God. Changed everything. He had found the one thing worth everything. Then you think about those shepherds on the hillside keeping the flock by night when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Remember they were just going about their business and an angel showed up and announced to them that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And when they went to see what the angels had told them about, they found Jesus and they went back rejoicing, changed because of the experience. They weren't looking for that. That was an unexpected blessing. Think about the woman at the well. The woman in Samaria who every day would go out to the well when no one else was around because of her reputation to get water. And one day, who was at the well? Jesus. That changed her life. Not only changed her life, But God used her to change the lives of the people in her village as well. 
So you see, sometimes we find the one thing worth everything unexpectedly. The Apostle Paul was someone who was actually a um, he was actually a murderer and someone who led the charge against Christianity. People were they lost their homes and their some of them their even their lives and their livelihoods because of the Apostle Paul. And when he was on his way to Damascus to do more mayhem for the Christian faith, he wasn't expecting Jesus to show up. But Jesus did. Changed his life 180 degrees. Sometimes you find the greatest thing you could ever find. The kingdom of God. The presence and the power of Jesus Christ when you're not even expecting it. Maybe that that's how it came upon you. Maybe that's how you experienced it. And maybe that's your experience today. Maybe you grew up without uh, God even on your radar. And you began a career, you began maybe your, your college education uh, with really no thought about God or the things of God. And you began to make compromises and you began to settle for the pull of materialism and the things that the world has to offer you, and that has become really your life. You've been stuck in a rut. And maybe you're here tonight, and you, you came just because somebody invited you, or because it was something to do, or because you just uh, was expected of you to be here. You're sort of like that plowman, plowing without hope. But the good news is that you can find the one thing worth everything unexpectedly when you least expect it. And tonight, you can experience the greatest treasure anyone could ever have, and that is to have Jesus Christ in your life. Experience forgiveness of your sin, the removal of guilt and shame, and to experience the power of God on a daily basis in your life. You see, sometimes that happens when you least expect it. But I told you there was another side of this coin, of this parable, and it's found in verses 45 through 46. Yes, not only can you find God's treasure when you least expect it in, in an unexpected way, but you can also find God's treasure by diligently seeking it. Look at verses 45 through 46. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value... He went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. You see, sometimes God's treasure can be found by diligently seeking for it. Some are surprised by God's presence in their life. Others have been seeking it seemingly all their life. And then they find it. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price... He went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. See, this is a story about a traveling pearl merchant. This is no plowman. This is no everyday common man. This is not a, you know, a, a day worker, not a shopkeeper. He's a man of business, but more than that, he's not even a collector. He's a dealer. He is someone who really understands and knows the value of something. He has spent his whole life learning to recognize value. And learning to seek it with all of his uh, experience and all of his uh, being. There's really few people such as this because he understands what real value is. He has an eye for it. He has great skill in recognizing the shape and the tint and the smoothness and the value of a pearl. He is someone who has uh, great experience in looking for things of great value. And he's been seeking pearls. You need to understand that up until maybe 150 years ago, pearls were the most precious of all gems. You know, they in, in Jesus' day, diamonds hadn't really uh, been discovered or they were so rare that, uh, you know, they, you couldn't really market them until they were discovered in Africa about 150 years ago or so. It was pearls that were really the most valuable uh, gem that anybody could have. And you read through history, and it's amazing. You know, Cleopatra had a collection of pearls worth over $4 million. 
Caesar, it's said, that gave his uh, friend Brutus's mother a set of pearls valued at $350,000. Pearls are something that's very valuable and have been throughout history. And here is a man who is seeking the greatest, the most valuable, the most precious of all those pearls. And in his search, it takes him somewhere in the Middle East in the tent of a sheik. And after the obligatory hospitality, the, the you know, Bedouin, Middle Eastern uh, culture, the sheik probably leads him into the back of the tent, behind a curtain. And he takes out a, a, a velvet bag, and he empties the bag in his palm. And as he does so, the pearl merchant sees the most beautiful, the most perfect, the most precious pearl he's ever seen in his life. After a lifetime, of seeking pearls and buying and dealing them, he finds the one pearl that's worth anything else. And what does he do? He goes and he liquidates his whole business, his whole belongings, everything else, so he can buy the one pearl of great price because he had discovered the one thing worth everything to him. And Jesus is trying to tell us in this story that God's treasure can be found by diligently seeking. The one thing worth everything can be found when you're really looking for it, when you desire it, when you seek it. That's the timely truth here. And I I think sometimes we, and we read this story and we think, man, that is, that's radical. Why, how, how crazy would it be to sell everything you have, all the other pearls and all your belongings, just so you could have one pearl? And I read about a New York socialite back in 1917 who traded her home on Fifth Avenue for a pearl valued at a million dollars. And I read about back in the early 1900s off the island of Ceylon where they invited uh, pearl divers to come and from all over the world and dive to bring up pearls. And there was over 5,000 of them that uh, went under the water and, and brought up uh, pearls, and they brought up 81 million oysters. The, root, the truth is only about two in a thousand oysters have a real pearl in them. So this is really valuable, rare, and precious. And so when this man found one of great value, he knew that it was worth everything else in order to possess it. There are those who actively seek the best things in life. And that may be you. And there are those who actively seek uh, fulfillment in their life and the most valuable things that they think they can find in this world. They may seek fulfillment through relationships or in work. They might seek fulfillment or real value in learning or collecting degrees or in physical fitness or in position or power. But if you're looking for, for real fulfillment and real value in those things, compared to the one thing worth everything, the person and power of Christ, those other things are just like paste pearls. Because there's only one thing worth everything. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach us in this. And maybe you're here and you're seeking peace with God and you have been seeking peace with God and you've been seeking salvation and you've been seeking a a way to have your sins forgiven and your guilt removed. And the good news is that Jesus promises that seekers can be finders and your search can be rewarded. You know what's great? Is that even if you're seeking for the things of God, when you find it, what you discover is it's more valuable and more precious and greater than what you ever even imagined. I think about the Ethiopian eunuch who had gone to Jerusalem to search for the things of God, to search for truth about God. And he was leaving empty and disappointed. And then Philip, led by the Holy Spirit, intercepted his chariot, remember? And shared with him, as he was reading the book of Isaiah, shared shared with him about the truth about Jesus Christ and how he could be forgiven and how God had become real in his life. 
And he said, stop the chariot. Let me get baptized right now as a declaration of the change in my heart. See, sometimes you discover the greatest thing that you could ever find, the one thing worth everything, because you're still diligently seeking it. And that's good news. You see, your search could end today. It could end tonight. If you're looking for God to be real in your life, if you're looking for your sins to be forgiven, if you're looking for the power of God to be real in your life, you can experience it today. That's the promise of God. And so you see, in this parable, Jesus tells us that sometimes you find the greatest treasure you can ever find unexpectedly. And other times you can find it by diligently seeking. But here's the third point I want to make tonight. When you think about these two parables that Jesus has told us, here's the third point, and this is, this is critical, I think, and that is simply this. That God's treasure, when you find it, is worth everything. When you find God, when you find Jesus Christ, that's worth everything. And the question we have to answer is, are we willing to give up everything in order to have the one thing worth everything? We have to recognize it for what it is. It is the discovery of a lifetime. Life offers many things of value, but there's only one thing worth everything. Jesus is God in the flesh. It's Jesus who left heaven and he walked among us and he died for our sins and he was buried and he rose again on the third day. And he offers you the free gift of salvation and he loves you and he's willing to forgive you and he empowers you and he fulfills you. He is the one thing worth everything. It's in him that we find mercy and grace and peace and strength for our daily walk. We have this promise of His presence and of power in our life to overcome whatever circumstance or situation we might find ourselves in. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Can I share with you quickly how I found it? I am sort of a combination of those two, of the uh, uh, unexpectedness and the diligently seeking. Because, see, I grew up in church. My parents made sure I grew up in church and I went to Sunday school and I heard the preaching week after week after week. And when I was nine years old, that sort of came all to a, um, a focal point in my life. One day I was walking home from school. I was about halfway home and the, there was a storm brewing. In fact, when I looked up at the sky, it was one of those skies that was really angry looking. And it looked like there could be a tornado any moment. And I'm only halfway home. Now, what I'm going to say may be colored a little bit uh, by the fact that I had recently watched The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> but I thought to myself, what would happen to me if I didn't make it home? What if a tornado came down right now and I didn't make it home? Would I go to heaven? And you know my answer as a nine-year-old was no. I wouldn't. I had never made Christ king of my life. I had never uh, asked him to come in and take charge of my life. But you know what? Halfway between school and home, I was nine years old. That's what I did. And i got to tell you something. The next day at school, everything looked different. Everything seemed different. And it has been different ever since. I found the one thing worth everything. Have you? You so, see, when you recognize it for what it is, you need to be willing to risk everything in order to have it. You need to be willing to say, I give up everything else so that I can possess the one thing worth everything. After all, the discovery of a lifetime is not something you just shrug about or take casually. But you make Jesus number one in your life because he is the discovery of a lifetime. He is the one thing worth everything. And are you living in such a way 
that demonstrates that he is the one thing worth everything in your life? That's the question we need to ask every day. Let me just close with this, this parable. This is not a biblical parable. It's a parable from a, another country, a parable of India. It's a story about a, a, a blind beggar who was sitting on a very deserted road, wearing only a loincloth and holding a bowl of which the few passerbys that did come along would put a few grains of rice in his bowl. And that's all he had the loincloth and the bowl with a few grains of rice in it. And he sat along this road that stretched, seemed like nowhere in both directions. But one day, something dramatic happened. He began to hear hoofbeats, and he began to hear a great deal of noise and commotion. And, and then he began to hear shouting and, and names being called. And he realized that this was the great uh, entourage of the Maharaja, who was passing him by. And he thought, this could be the day that something wonderful could happen. My life could change today. And sure enough, the chariot of the Maharaja stopped. The Maharaja got down and he walked over to the blind beggar. And the blind beggar was anticipating something wonderful happening. And then the Maharaja said to the blind beggar, give me your rice. The beggar was dumbfounded. He was angry. What does the Maharaja want with my rice? That's all that I have. And he sort of angrily reached in and got one grain of rice and he gave it to the Maharaja. And the Maharaja said, is that all? The blind beggar spit on the ground and he, he cursed and he got another grain of rice and he threw it out toward the Maharaja. With that, the Maharaja got back in his chariot rode off and was gone. And there was the blind beggar sitting there, heartbroken, dumbfounded, stunned over what had happened. And just absent-mindedly, just fingering the bowl, and he realized there was something different in his bowl. Instead of rice, there was something hard. And he realized that it was a gold nugget. And then he reached in and he found another one. There was two gold nuggets. And he threw the rest of the rice out. They meant nothing to him now. And then he realized, he realized if he had given the Maharaja all of his rice, he would have got a gold nugget for every grain of rice. And he would have been a wealthy man. You know, I, I think about that story. And I realize this. None of us have even something as valuable as a grain of rice to give to Jesus that he might give us his love and righteousness and forgiveness in return. But that's exactly what he does. He asks us to give all that we have. And all that we have is nothing but filthy rags. He says, you give me that and I will trade you. My love, all the riches of heaven, for yours. What a deal. Have you made that deal? If not, will you make that deal? You can make it tonight. You know, the Bible tells us, Jesus' story tells us that you can find the greatest treasure you could ever find unexpectedly. Even if you weren't expecting to find it tonight, you can have it. Or you've been maybe dismally seeking for it. You can be rewarded. Your search can be rewarded tonight because you can have the one thing worth everything. And you can have the forgiveness of sins. You can have eternal life. You can experience the grace and power of God in your life tonight. And you can leave here a changed person. And I want to say this to you who have already made that exchange. Are you living in such a way that demonstrates that Jesus is the one thing worth everything in your life. If not, you may need to ask God to forgive you and to repent of the fact that you have nonchalantly and cavalierly accepted the most valuable thing anybody could have. But you might say from this day forward, I'm going to honor God as the number one in my life and He's, he, he is the one thing worth everything. 
And I want to thank him and praise him every day. And I want to live in such a way that honors him and demonstrates that I possess the greatest treasure anyone could have. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to have a time of invitation. Your pastor's going to come to the front. and um, Are we going to sing a song? Okay. And whatever God speaks to you about tonight, would you respond? Whether you want to receive that one thing worth everything or whether you want to ask God to help you live in such a way that you bring honor to it. Would you respond as God speaks to your heart?